Welcome back to session three of our forum. Our first topic this afternoon uh, is specialization and routes to higher education. What international assessment data tells us about high performing education systems? The session will be moderated by Dr. Hanan Khalifa, Director of Education, uh, Transformation and Impact. But our speaker is Tim Oates, CBE, Group Director of Assessment, Research and Development at Cambridge University. Before handing over, let me share that um, Tim was created a commander of the British Empire in the New Year's Honours List in 2015 for his work in leading the National Curriculum Review. And Tim, we're very grateful that you're able to join this forum. Over to you. Well, thank you very much indeed for the opportunity to present. And today I'm going to look at um, international evidence around this particular very, very demanding issue about what in essence, what shape our education systems should be or could be to ensure that we have good progression, uh, both into the economy, but I'm going to focus on higher education, progression into higher education. Um, could I have the first slide, please? Thank you. So, pandemic, of course, has stimulated huge amounts of debate and controversy. Um, there are many, many voices that suddenly we have begun to hear. Some of them we're beginning to hear again. Um, they were critical voices from the past um, and, and they were quiet for a bit, but suddenly pandemic has opened up an opportunity for them also to make their voices heard again. There are many, many different agendas and we, we need to be quite cautious about the evidence behind each voice. This is, this is going to be a strong theme in this presentation. After all, if, if education broadly goes through three phases, just getting young people into schools is the first phase, then, then extending participation up and down is the second phase. Driving on quality is very much the third phase and quality in education is heavily contested. That's, that's very clear from the nature of, of ongoing debate prior to pandemic, but even more true of, of debate going forward from pandemic and we're still pretty much gripped in the middle of pandemic of course so when people say what should we do as we come out of pandemic we've got to remember exactly where we are where we are now is we have to very much care for young people we have to understand the stresses on the systems uh, we have to understand what we do with kids who have and how we care for kids who have suffered from interrupted education so, yes, it's probably right to think about, well, what should our, what shape should our education systems be? In other words, how many subjects we should encourage people to study at different phases? When should we have examinations? And, and so on. It's right to consider those things. But we, we, we mustn't just simply announce an intention to reform without understanding where we are in relationship to disruption of our education arrangements around the world. And, and one of the things I've been emphasizing strongly is pre-pandemic issues and the quality of thinking prior to pre-pandemic should not be ignored. We, we have excellent evidence on high quality education. We have brilliant comparativists like Bill Schmidt. We have excellent surveys like Pisa, Tins and Pearls. These were your deep into education and education systems. That body of evidence uh, we should continue to look to, to tell us uh, really with, with considerable confidence what we should do. Um, what, what should we look at when we think about this key question of progression uh, into uh, uh, higher education from 16? Well, we need to think about the function of assessment and qualifications at the age of 16. It's easy to think them just as, as tests, um, but they're much more than that. We need to think about the balance of the modes of assessment uh, 
coursework, continuous assessment, um, because those things uh, determine the way in which the assessment actually supports the learning, as well as producing um, a statement of what somebody knows, understands and can do. We need to think about teacher workload, um, because exams always carry workload, uh, and working two exams structures what teachers do. We need to think about student workload and stress. In running exams, we need to think about maintenance of standards, and we've had to suspend that kind of thinking for a bit, um, because of the level of disruption that we've experienced in education systems. But we need to think about maintenance of standards, something which I will come on to when I look at the data from Sweden, a leading, leading nation in, in just a moment. Um, we need to think about the role of qualifications in reform because assessment very much drives learning in so many countries. And, and if you want to reform education, often it's a temptation to, to simply say we can achieve it all by reforming our assessments. Reform is more complex than that. It requires all sorts of form of support in terms of professional development, institutional development. We've written about that extensively at Cambridge, and we can put some of those references up. And qualifications play a key role in that, if you want to reform education, but it's, it's not the sole thing that you need to change. And assuming that you can entirely affect reform through reforming assessment is, is a naive position, and we really counsel against that. And you have to think about routes and tracks. We have general academic, vocational, mixes of those things. Uh, when it starts, in, in, in the vocational track starts at the age of 10 in Holland, in the Netherlands. It, typically it starts in the age of 16 in countries like Sweden and Germany. Um, so so that's, that, those are the key things that we really need to talk about. Next slide, please. Thank you. So England is... This is typical. People are saying, well, should we have the exams that we've got in a, a post-pandemic world? And one key thing that we have in England are examinations at 16. And there have been a lot of those assessments. Um, but if you do what I've argued for at the beginning, which is actually, say, well, what's the evidence and the agenda which each one of these voices is putting forward, um, you, you get some interesting insights into how we should consider the various arguments which are being put forward and what kind of policy we should actually adopt. Now we have exams at the age of 16 in England and uh, that's the end of what we call compulsory education, although typically young people stay in education until the age of, of, of between 22 and 25, because they'll be going on to do something, whether it's vocational or academic, either in um, higher education, in further education, technical colleges, or in a combination of work and technical education. But at 16, we have this very important set of examinations in subjects like the sciences, maths, biology, chemistry, uh, sorry, uh, physics, biology, chemistry, in mathematics, in language, in literature, history, geography, and so on. There's, there's, there's a, a wide range of subjects. Typically, um, there are examinations in nine subjects, and these also form the building box of the curriculum. Children will have made choices at 14 as to which subjects they will major on and then be assessed on at the age of 16. In total, at the age, in the summer uh, of, of, of the last year of compulsory education, they will face quite a concentrated period of, of about a month where they'll take around 30 hours of examinations. It's quite a big load um, and, and it does have implications for student welfare. Some, some young people get very stressed by this very high examination load and we have moved away from there being a large contribution of coursework, which there was in the past to the final grade. We focus more on examinations, about 30 hours of them in about nine subjects. And in looking at that, it, it, it's, it, as I said earlier, the tendency is to look at it in terms of the assessment. But actually, those examinations 
carry a very broad range of functions in our education system. They are, provide a very clear specification of program content for the preceding two to three years. It's what kids study for two to three years, the topics, the issues. These examinations provide a statement of standards and that indicates the depth of treatment of each topic or area within the subject. Um, the grade supports progression because that helps the decisions of selectors, whether, they're, whether these children are going to move to a vocational route or whether they're going to go on to study A-levels, uh, advanced secondary education, and then progress on to higher education. They support the decisions about routes. Of course, they provide motivating targets for learners. Learners can see what it is that they need to get a high grade and are motivated to get high grades. And overall, the data that come from these assessments provide, provide quality assurance of education for the state, but also for parents and for others like the National Inspection Service. So, yes, they're examinations, but look at the functions that they carry. So, the key take-out message for this, for any policymakers considering reform, is that if somebody says, get rid of this examination, you have to understand the complex functions that each assessment or examination carries across the whole of the education system and for a period of time in that education system. Remove it and you'll have to do all these other things, clear specification of programme content, a statement of standards, an indication of depth of treatment, motivating targets for learners. You'll have to do that through some other means if you think they're desirable functions. I think they're highly desirable functions. They are something which most advanced systems have. So yes, there are voices in England that say, get rid of GCSE because of the workload on teachers, because of the workload on kids, um, because of the way in which they are linked critically to accountability, the quality assurance of education and national targets. Um, but if you remove them, you, 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 you threaten these functions. You have to think about what you might replace them with. And the reason I mention this debate in the UK is not because I'm being Anglo-centric, it's because this is a typical kind of debate. Uh, many countries have abolitionists in relationship to existing arrangements. Before you move from what you've got, you have to know that what you're going to put in place is better and carries the more or same functions. Next slide, please. So this brings me to Sweden. So Sweden doesn't have national tests of the kind that we have, of national examinations. It's basically done by teacher assessment. They're beginning to reintroduce some national assessments, although they are administered by teachers, and I'll explain why in a moment. Look at the dates. From 1998 to 2012, um, the data have been tracked. And this is in a brilliant report by uh, Yarvaval and Henriksen, the IVA report, and look, the grades were going up. And in this system where there was heavy, heavily, heavy, heavy, heavy marketization of schools, with the idea that if you marketize schools, then the competition will schools between schools will raise standards of education, you have steadily rising grades, impressively rising grades. That's the black line from 1998 to 2012. That looks really impressive. But then when you look at the evidence, the high quality evidence from the international surveys, what you find is dramatically declining educational standards. Now, I can't emphasize how serious this is. You have grades improving, but underlying standards declining dramatically. There's something going very wrong here in this nation. And I can say that with authority because that's what Swedish politicians, all parties, and Sweden, Swedish society itself is saying. When we look at this, there's something very wrong with our, our education system. There's something very wrong with our assessments. So the functions which I described are not being delivered in a highly marketized system, having high stakes assessment run on a teacher assessed basis. This, this is, gives us very strong pause for thought. And, and look at the time frame. This went on over a very long period of time, so quite difficult to correct. 
And the drop in standards has been really very, very significant. They're working hard to change it and they're taking advice from Cambridge and from other places, thank goodness. So they, they, they know they have a problem, but they got themselves into a, a very difficult situation by making some bad decisions. Next slide, please. Thank you. So we have two key reports, which I'm gonna talk through now, and I'll be very brief. I've got about five more minutes. We had a very odd day. What, what, what I knew was that we would need to justify the existence of, of GCSE, these nine exams for each child. They can choose from a large number, but they basically do nine. They have to do maths and English, the sciences, and, and a couple of other compulsory subjects. And, and we simply said, well, what do highly, high, really high-performing systems do? We didn't say how many countries have GCSEs. We said, let's look at what the really high-performing systems do. And then we had criteria for choosing those based on the data from the large international surveys. We then updated that report in 2020 because of the voices raised increasingly loudly saying, let's get rid of GCSE. Uh, because of the, the kind of disruption of normal discourse that was occurring during the pandemic. So those are the two reports, um, the 2015 report, and then the 2020 report, which is an update, uh, absolute latest version of that 2015 report. So next slide, please. Who did we look at? Well, look, look at that group of, of nations. It, it ranges widely right the way across the world. And what we found is that Whilst people in England were saying, well, we're the only country that has examinations at 16 that look anything like this, um, we said that's just empirically not true. That's what our study says. We looked across all these nations and we found that the majority of high performing systems have external, uh, sorry, have high stakes assessment. So they have high stakes assessment at 16, which determine the next steps in education. But we also found that a number of the key high performing systems have external high stakes assessment. Example, countries like Singapore, which are really looked to as countries of excellence, Japan, um, Canada, China, critically, I and mean, you know, Shanghai, top in PISA in mathematics when it first came in and Estonia, the new darling of, of international comparativists. There are some which don't have, nonetheless, high stakes assessment at the age of 16. Next slide, please. So these are the key findings. There is no single approach to assessment at the end of basic secondary education. Um, being associated with success. We've got mistakes with teacher assessment. So, so that's fine. But contrary to the perceptions expressed in many parts of the English media, around two thirds of those high, really high performing uh, jurisdictions, including several from across Europe, use external assessment at the end of basic secondary education. These external assessment is a critical role in determining future student directions in upper secondary education. Uh, for example, in Finland, uh, although it's teacher assessment uh, and there are no exams at 16, the grades you get up to that point really determine which schools you can have access to in your 16 to 19 phase. That there's hidden high stakes and hidden accountability in the Finnish education system. All of this is rooted in meritocratic principles. If somebody does well in a subject, then they, they should have a high chance of continuing that subject. There's no evidence to suggest that abandoning external assessment is a good thing in terms of high institute high performance. And using assessment at the end of basic education for the purpose of accountability is not necessarily a bad thing. So this is what the OECD data tells us that most most systems use the data from assessment, high stakes, for judging the performance of schools in the system. And England is not unique in this respect. Estonia and Shanghai do exactly the same. Um, and both 
in internal and external assessment at the end of basic secondary education can be high stakes. So it can be internal, not by exam, but still be high stakes for students. Right, next slide, and I'll just talk for about three or four more minutes. So what are, what are the recommendations? Um, understanding, rea and, and I'll talk about progression to higher education in, in, right at the end, because that's really critical and it's the key theme of this presentation. The first thing is we have to understand realities and use sound, sound evidence because many of the voices which say, well, reform, just get rid of these examinations. They're bad for kids, they're high workload for schools. Well, you've got to think about the functions. We've got to use sound evidence. And when they say, well, very few countries do this, yeah, that's not what the evidence says. And, and there is mis it gives rise to what I call misleading exceptionalism. Frankly, Yes, there are people who stand up in England and say, well, when you compare us with every other nation, everybody does it differently. But that doesn't mean that every nation does it the same. And it does mean that if you stand up in Germany and say, well, you know, does Germany do it differently from everybody else? The answer is yes. <laughs> Almost every country has peculiarities and specific aspects of their arrangements, whether they are a Gulf state uh, whether they're in Central Asia or whether they're in Europe or the Americas. So you've got to be careful of this misleading exceptionalism. Everyone does it different for, differently from us. Those reports I've cited look systematically at the, at the similarities and differences between nations. The second point is functions and quality are all important. If you change or remove assessment, what functions are no longer supported? And I've outlined the really complex and key range of functions in education systems that examinations carry. Quality criteria for the measurement of the characteristic of assessment still apply. Everything that we knew about high quality assessment prior to pandemic should still be uppermost in our minds in terms of reliability, validity, utility and the other key characteristics of a good test that measures what it should measure with precision giving us a good description of what people know, understand, and can do. All of those quality criteria still apply and apply to any of the alternatives which people are suggesting. And the third and final point is the key one and linking absolutely to the topic of this presentation. Remember the ecosystem of assessment and education. And England exemplifies this. And I encourage you to think about the story of England and think about your own systems. For England, the GCSE at 16, nine subjects, 30 hours of examinations, is at the end of general education when people study a broad range of subjects. And if they're gonna drop subjects and go either into a vocational track or the academic track, then you need some kind of record of the subjects that they're no longer going to study. If they're only going to study science from now on, you probably want some record of how well they did in history. Now, in England, they progress from nine or so subjects to studying three or four specialisms from 16 to 18 at A-level. And there really are specialist studies. Uh, they enable people to progress to three-year degrees of high quality. And the thing which we need to recognize there is they also move from the state paying for their education to them paying for their education themselves at university. They do it typically by student loans from the government, but they pay for it themselves. Now, if we move from having three to four subjects studied in tremendous detail in A-level, we will probably need four-year degrees. That means that families and students will need to pay for an additional year of university. If we get rid of GCSEs, then we probably won't be able to have A-levels of the same form, and that then will impact on whether young people have studied to sufficient depth to allow us to have three-year intensive degrees, which at places like Cambridge and Oxford, which after all, are rightly seen as some of the best degree and higher education programs in the world of short duration, high intensity, and very, very high quality. People say, well, you know, Germany, Tim, the abattoir. 
that um, you know they study up to eleven subjects to, in, in in Germany. You know they don't have A levels, Tim. You know they have a far larger number of subjects. Mm. But when you look at the examinations they take at the age of eighteen prior to university, they're almost exactly like the A levels in England. In Germany, young people only take between three and four exams, and they have teacher assessment in the other subjects that they study. And they really wind down, actually, in the studying of those subjects as they begin to gear up for the three or four subjects which are going to study at A-level. And they'll say, oh, America doesn't have A-levels. Only it does. It's got the advanced placement. Again, typically in three or four subjects, and children study these in enormous depth. So you've got to remember how if we got rid of GCSEs, what impact that would have on A-levels, and what impact that would have on the duration, intensity, and nature of higher education. These things are an ecosystem. Changing one impacts on all the others. So that's where I'll end. To just to say we've done this really, I think, high quality international comparative work, and it leads to these three recommendations and observations. Understand the realities and use sound evidence. The functions and quality of a specific assessment are all important and must be considered, and they must be considered in the light of what the ecosystem of progression of assessment and education is in a particular national setting. Thank you very much indeed. You're, you're muted, Hannah. Thank you. Uh, so questions have been coming in and a couple of them are related to Iraq. So please feel free if, um, if you don't have experience there. So the question, the first one that came is from, um, from, right, from uh, Mr. Abbas Nejma Abdullah. What's your outlook on education in Iraq specifically? And another one from uh, Anwar al-Bukhari. What are the educational improvements and changes that Iraq has seen in its relationships with, um, with its surroundings? Thank you. I mean, I have followed, I'm afraid, only at great distance, the events that have been happening in Iraq. And, and I have followed them over a long period of time. I think, for me, the, the two key things uh, is the clear communication in the nation of both curriculum content and the standards that should be associated with depth of treatment in the curriculum. That remains an essential, I think. And if it can be held relatively constant, those expectations, then teachers can begin to build up materials, um, donor agencies or local municipalities or the nation state can provide materials and information that support teachers in understanding curriculum content and the standards which should be used in depth of treatment. That's what should be really visible at system level. I think what we've seen though over time is tremendous disruption to education and periods of interruption. Uh, and there we're doing work in Cambridge on interrupted education. And there we particularly highlight the link between formative assessment and summative assessment. Uh, there's a, a, a blog which you might like to access, which we have on our Cambridge Press and Assessment website called The Hyper Problem of Interrupted Education, which I've drafted recently in the light of international evidence on interrupted education. And what that highlights is the extent to which we should be using the content of, of exams for formative assessment to really help and support each individual child so that we know how they've been affected by interruption. And if we use those questions systematically and sympathetically, continuously through education, we can really support individual children, which also helps us to teach them as groups and therefore improve equity, deal with the impact of interruption and raise attainment. So I, I, I think those are the two, Ken, the two things, the, the, the precision around the understanding of the curriculum and the standards, looking at depth of treatment, and then having good tools in formative assessment to support groups of young people. Uh, the emphasis on formative assessment is incontrovertible. The international work of Paul Black, 
and, and Dylan William shows us how we can use formative assessment in different nations and different curriculum contexts to really raise attainment and to support young people and also help teachers. Right. Uh, time for one more question from Mr. Raghav El Haisi. How can Arabic speaking countries with constraints on technical infrastructure, limited experience, expertise in online education and or digital education be able to really speed up um, and match the rapid move of digitalization? I, I think this is this is really important. And I think people are uh, there is a problem that people overstate the assets of digital by un, un, uh, by unjustified criticisms on the features of previous education. Okay, so so for example, the attack on textbooks would be a, a characteristic of that. People justify the advantages of digital by an undue attack on paper-based materials. Now, that, that don't take from that that I'm anti-digital, I'm not. But I am critical of the way that people have justified the shift to digital and have written extensively about that. Now, what I would argue is we have experience of hundreds of years of high quality education, hundreds of years. And we distilled that nicely over the last two decades. And they remain principles at the heart of good education. And interestingly, they also should be at the heart of high quality digital education. And sometimes they're not. In the, in the quarter of a million digital applications that we have so much difficulty in choosing between. If we have young people together being supported by a teacher, the quality of that teaching is fundamental. The skills of the teacher are fundamental. Supporting them with good materials, paper materials, remains critical. And we, we highlight the kind of characteristics of what teachers should be doing. Fewer things in greater depth, high quality formative assessment, systematic use of good materials, supported by good staff development, sharing experience on things which work. And, and those should be a feature of all education systems. And the thing is, they're also principles that apply when you use digital. So I think that there's, it, there are many, many ways in which countries that don't have access to digital resources can continue to really improve equity and attainment based on the really good evidence that, that we marshal here. Well, thank you very much indeed, Tim for sharing in depth from your research and so succinctly and accessibly. And thank you, Hanan, for conducting the questions in, in that session. Thank you both. You're welcome. Thanks, David. Thank you very much, indeed. It's now my real pleasure to welcome to the stage uh, Jeff Majin Calder. Um, Jeff is uh, Chief Executive Officer of Coursera. And this is a session which is of personal interest for reasons which I will share. My first encounter with uh, Coursera was in 2012, while organizing a conference with the University of London on MOOCs, Massive Online Open Courses which were then a very new thing that everybody was suspicious about. Now, at that time, Coursera, which was a speaker at the event, was seen as a highly innovative uh, idea uh, that had the potential to massively increase the availability of quality programs to students right around the world. Jeff, can you talk us through the journey from then to the massive player that Coursera now is in the world? Dave, well, first, first of all, thank you for having me here. And I'm excited to be here as well. I mean, it's really incredible, not just what's happened over the last 10 years. And I'll give a, a quick arc of the history of Coursera. But even just in the last 18 months, you know, since the pandemic and now, um, 
throughout the world, individuals and institutions are thinking about what does world the world look like uh, post pandemic. And there's a really incredible power of not just online learning, which affords anyone anywhere the chance to get access to education, but remote work is also really opening up a lot of job opportunities for people who don't necessarily live in communities where those job opportunities are open. So I, I'm really excited about the transformative properties of, of what technology can do, not just in terms of learning opportunities, but in terms of job opportunities. Now, quickly, in terms of Stanford, uh, uh, Coursera's history. So it was started at Stanford. A couple of computer science professors, Andrew Ng and Daphne Kohler, taught very um, popular computer science classes. And they put some of these classes on the internet. This was back in 2012, right around the time that you had stumbled on Coursera. And, um, and they saw just overwhelming demand. Over 100,000 people came to take these courses. At the time, they were just video video. Um, segments that you could stream. And since that time, so we were started in 2012, Coursera has grown to be really a learning ecosystem. So what started as, if you will, an experiment at Stanford University has turned into a, a global platform that brings together about 90 million individuals from around the world, 80% uh, of whom are not in the US. We now have 170 universities and 70 uh, industry partners. This is like Google and Microsoft and Facebook and others um, who have authored more than 5,000 courses. And so these are online courses with assessments. We also have professional certificates, series of, of courses called specializations and even full bachelor's and master's degrees. Uh, the, the university partnerships uh, really span the globe. So a lot of university partners in the US and in Europe, we also have partners in the Middle East. So Jordan University of Science and Technology, Khalifa University, Al-Faisal, um, just you know, a, a wide range of universities. And they're producing courses across subjects such as you know, business, technology, data science, and others. Uh, importantly, about five, six years ago, we launched Coursera for Business. This helps businesses upskill and reskill employees. We launched Coursera for Government. This helps governments uh, upskill civil service workers, and also with workforce development, help individuals get skilled up to become employed. And then most recently in October of 2019, we launched Coursera for Campus, which is a version of Coursera for any academic institution in the world to use to integrate high quality online learning into their curriculum so that their students can have a blend of online and in-person uh, education. Mm. That's fantastic. I, mean, I was just noting some numbers down, as you were saying, when I was doing my research for this, the number that features was 80 million learners. Yeah, yeah. We are now up to 90, and it was only a couple of months ago that I, I was doing that. So that's that's terrific. Can we, can we look at COVID? Mm -hmm. Because COVID really disrupted in many ways uh, what we know and love as higher education mm -hmm. around the world. But on the other hand, COVID unlocked a lot of developments and ideas which were there in, in theory, but not used in practice for all sorts of reasons. So can I ask what trends are you seeing from institutions that are navigating COVID-19? Yeah, well, the, the, the first obvious one, this was in 2020, um, and we saw it kind of country by country. So as countries were going through lockdown, we saw our servers spiking first in Asia and then in, um, in Spain and in Italy and in France. Uh, so we can kind of see that happening. We had about 47 million learners on Coursera at the beginning of 2020. During 2020, an additional 30 million individuals came right to Coursera.org. You know, UNESCO said in April of 2020, 1.6 billion students had their campuses closed from kindergarten through college. And so what you had is this incredible forced experiment where virtually every teacher and professor in the world had to teach online and almost every student had to learn online. And that was pretty tough because what a lot of teach, you know, many universities were not prepared for it, of course, and many just switched right to Zoom. So instead of lecturing in a classroom, I'll turn on my Zoom camera and just lecture to the camera. 
Yeah. This is not always the best learning experience. I mean, what we've developed with our partners over the years on Coursera is not just you know, people recording a Zoom lecture. They're, they're, they're hands-on, they're engaging, they have assessments built into them. So there, there really are kind of online materials that were designed to be online. But what's been really fascinating about this is not only have individuals really embraced uh, online learning, they're not exclusively, but there's a lot of flexibility and, 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 and um, range and convenience built into online learning. But we've also seen institutions embrace online learning. So now we have over 2,300 uh, businesses using Coursera because they had to stop their in-person training and they're realizing that the need for digital transformation, the need to learn uh, cloud computing and the need to integrate data science and artificial intelligence into the way they run their businesses has increased. And so we've seen a big rise in the number of employers using it. And especially with campuses, one of the things that we did with our partners is in the spring of 2020, before the pandemic in February of 2020, we had about 30 universities using Coursera for campus, kind of integrating the courses on Coursera into their curriculum. Once the lockdown happened, we decided to do what we called the Campus Response Initiative. And this is working with our university partners to make Coursera for Campus available at no cost for the rest of the school year and then up through September. We saw 4,000 universities adopt Coursera for Campus in seven months. And millions of students take 28 million course enrollments uh, through their universities just during that seven month period. So institutions also have really uh, been embracing online and trying to figure out how to make this work in an integrated and blended way. Can I press you a little bit on that? Because as um, a former university registrar, I've seen how university staff don't always welcome innovations mm -hmm. like this they many of them see them as threats not as as opportunities and i could imagine that some staff would would look at what you're doing and feel threatened by it mm -hmm. and others would come along and embrace it because it enables them to to do such so much more what's your experience been of that and and what have you got to say to those staff who may be a little resistant of this change? Yeah, I think that, uh, first of all, what you say is very much what we see. So there is a wide range at the institutional level and then at the individual faculty level. There's a range of responses to what's been happening. And there's a range of responses to change and adaptation. I mean, ch change can be pretty hard. We typically see that the institutions are very interested in embracing new ways of doing things. Uh, most universities now are facing a level of competition from other online providers, whether those are boot camps or other kind of micro-credential providers. And so the administrations are saying, we've got to adapt. We have to make sure that what we're teaching our students is relevant to their employability when they graduate. Mm -hmm. And um, and if we don't do it, the students will find some other way to get those kinds of skills. And so often at the institutional level, there's a lot of interest in embracing uh, uh, services like Coursera for Campus. Mm -hmm. What we basically have seen and, and, and the way that universities use these uh, courses on Coursera, it varies. But basically, here's what we have seen is, is kind of three basic use cases. The um, one of them, which is what you might expect, is using Coursera as like a digital textbook, where at the professor level, they do hybrid courses. And so there's a course that's already taught by a professor, say it's a, a course in Java programming or a course in, in big data analytics or SQL or whatever. They can integrate courses from Coursera, including hands-on labs, because many of the university professors don't really have a modern infrastructure to doing kind of high compute, you know, hands-on lab work. And so they can integrate the materials into their existing courses and it's still their course. They're the, you know, the, the one who's designing the curriculum and, and they're offering it. It's like a digital textbook. And so on that one, you see certain professors saying, hey, I, I want to move more quickly. These are valuable resources. Of course, I've, I've embraced textbooks over the years. I will also embrace this digital courseware. We also, though, have seen many universities find that there are curricular gaps 
where they don't have any faculty to teach something like cybersecurity, perhaps, or, or, or blockchain, or some advanced deep learning or neural networks. And so they'll come in more at the administration level or at the dean's level and say, hey, we need to offer a course in, say, blockchain, and we don't have anybody that does that. And so we're going to complement our curriculum with standalone electives on Coursera. So this is one that's a little bit easier because there's really no incumbent course. And so the university realizes their student demand for these courses. And the, the third, and, that, and so that's usually a little bit easier sometimes than getting the faculty to build all the courses into kind of a hybrid model. And then finally, we've started seeing a lot of interest among career services centers to do career training. So this is a world where we say, okay, uh, when, the, when the professors and the faculty are ready, they can integrate this material. But even until then, on the career services side, let's make sure that students have resources to get certifications, qualifications, job training through Coursera, because you know we have a lot of experience with what employers are looking for. And so career services is a way to kind of get going, even when the faculty might be wanting a little bit more time to get comfortable with these models. Yeah. Let's move to the the institutional level. You've, you've mentioned that you know institutions are keen um, to to be involved in this, and in the Arab region, we know that you are working with the Association of Arab Universities and Arleen to try and build capacity uh, within the leadership of those institutions. Can you say a little bit more about what you're doing there? Yeah, we are We are really exciting, excited to be working with the Association of Arab Universities. Uh, when we go out and look at what's happening in the world, there's kind of four really big trends that we often see in higher education these days. One is kind of hybrid. And people often talk about hybrid learning and teaching, which I totally agree with, integrating digital materials into the on-campus and in-person uh, uh, modalities. But I also often talk about hybrid credentials. So not only do we have sort of a hybrid offline, online way of teaching, but we're seeing more and more universities not get rid of the college degree or keep it the same, but integrate micro-credentials into the college degree so that you can graduate with a bachelor's of computer science and maybe a specialization or concentration or honors in artificial intelligence or in data science or in business transformation or, or whatever. And so these hybrid credentials are turning out to be really valuable. A another major thing that we're seeing is a big focus on student employability, as I mentioned. So, so universities are thinking about how do we change our curriculum so that our graduates have the kinds of skills that employers are looking for. Another major theme that we're seeing is affordability, which is how can we use digital to reduce the cost of serving students? And then the final one that we often talk about is faculty development. Because generally speaking, the institutional capacity to adapt to change and to deliver these kinds of new modalities is dependent upon the faculty. So we have teamed up with the Association of Arab Universities and we put together what we're calling the Leadership Development Program with AARU. And what it is, is it's, it's two pathways that are available to administrators of universities so this is not for students, this is actually for administrators to, to, to really start learning about some of these new trends and kind of go hands-on first person and experience online learning from AARU and Coursera. There's one which is called the leader, Leaders Pathway. So um, we worked with AARU to actually curate a number of courses on high-performance collaboration from Northwestern, design thinking for innovation from University of Virginia, leading teams from University of Michigan, sustainable development from Yonsei University, AI for everyone from one of our founders. And so there's a, a series of courses that are available to leaders of, uh, of universities so that they can get a sense for some of these emerging trends. And then there's another pathway that we put together on aspiring leaders. So these might be faculty, associate professors who are not yet uh, high in the administration, but have the promise to be future influential leaders. And there's an eight course uh, pathway that we put together on inspiring and motivating individuals, strategic planning and execution, advanced business strategy, et cetera. So there's a training program for aspiring leaders. And both of these pathways are available 
to member universities at ARU. And, and we're really excited to use online learning to develop the capacity for online teaching. Well, the uptake of those programs has been very encouraging. And I believe the in, initial briefing took place last week. Mm -hmm. And um, we're certainly looking forward to learning from that, that particular pilot scheme. Yeah. Can I come to talk about the certificates? I mean, it, it is one thing to innovate within universities and within what you're doing. It's another thing for students to be able to communicate effectively what they have learned to prospective employers. Can you say a little bit about what Coursera is doing regarding professional certificates? Yeah, I mentioned that um, Coursera was started by a university at Stanford and we have 170 partners, but We've been building over the last three to five years a larger portfolio of partners uh, in industry. So Google and Facebook and Microsoft and IBM and others. And they not only put up courses on Coursera, but actually full professional certificates. And the way that these professional certificates work, and we have, we have 14 of them are entry level. Uh, these are basically digital jobs that don't require a college degree and they don't require any uh, previous experience. These are jobs in IT support, cybersecurity, data analyst, project management, UX design, social media manager, sales operations. There's a lot of jobs that are available if you've got digital skills. Microsoft estimates that in the next four years, 150 million new digital jobs will be created. So what a lot of universities are doing is they're saying, hey, you know what? We offer a lot of our standard curriculum on the fundamental and more durable domains of knowledge and often a, a well-rounded uh, curriculum. But we would like to insert into that curriculum these professional certificates. And so they're integrating a Google IT certificate or a Facebook social media marketing certificate so that when their students graduate, they have both a college degree and they have a very job-specific skills-based micro-credential that, that actually, frankly, complement each other. So I see a question that just came in. It says, if, if programs based on a realistic study, uh, based on real data are not presented and the causes of academic stumbling in the Arab countries are not presented, then the implementation of any plan to advance education will only be formal. And you know, one of the things that I really love about what we're seeing during the, and, and, and sort of now in the, in the, in the re, you know, evolving chapters of COVID is a willingness to experiment that you know, we've never seen before and a willingness to collaborate. You know, universities collaborating with other universities. So one university will take digital courses from Duke and offer that to their, to their students on, on agile transformation. Universities are collaborating with industry partners. And so a university will offer a professional certificate from IBM in, in cybersecurity. And so it really opens up the range of possibilities here. And what we've seen just in the last 12 months is 1.2 million course enrollments in these entry-level professional certificates. Many of these are students who wanna make sure when they graduate, they have not only a degree, but also an industry credential that is really tailored to the skills required to do that job upon graduation. Yeah. I think you're following something there, which some of the professions have been doing with universities and master's programs. And from what I've seen, that is working out extremely well mm -hmm. for the universities, for the students and for the professions as a whole. So uh, I think that seems like a very good direction of travel. Mm -hmm. Our time together is going amazingly quickly uh, so that I don't lose it. Um, we've got a major session in two days time mm -hmm. on women and the developing role of women and so on. And you, I believe, have launched a women and skills report, mm -hmm. which analyzes the state of skills among female learners on the platforms. Are you able to share the highlights from that globally and perhaps say a little bit more about the highlights from the Middle East? Yeah. Well, we, we uh, every year, I'd say for the last three years or so, we publish what we call the Global Skills Report. 
And we do this by looking at um, the learning behavior of these you know, tens of millions of learners on Coursera all around the world. The, our partners, when they create courses, the courses have in-course assessments built into them. And so we know for every student who takes a course, we know which, cor which questions they're getting right and which questions they're getting wrong in the assessments. We also tie those questions to what we call the skills graph. So we have a taxonomy of skills that are actually linked to those questions. So we have a sense for what skill is that question really probing on. And then we also have an estimated difficulty level. And so we can basically assess the relative skill proficiency in different uh, types of skills for students in different countries. And so we've been publishing this global skills report that kind of ranks different countries and says among learners in this country, how do they stack up in data science compared to these other countries? One of the things that we noticed as we were doing this is a real growing trend towards more women learning online. And so we put out a, uh, a special report, we called it Women in Skills. And what we saw is that during the pandemic, women turned to online learning in greater numbers than men. And I've really closed a lot of the gender gap in online learning and skill development. So in 2019, 45% of the new learners that registered on Coursera were women. So almost 50-50, but not quite. In 2021 so far, 50% of all the new learners on Coursera are women. So now it's an equal balance, women to men. In STEM courses, so science, technology, engineering, mathematics, in 2019, 31% of the STEM enrollments were from women learners. In 2021, it's jumped to 37%. So we're making good progress. And then the final thing I'll mention, I, I talked about those entry-level professional certificates. So those are those certificates that really are helping people switch careers or start a career in a digital field. 25% of course enrollments in these entry-level professional certificates in 2019 were from women. That's gone from 25% to 37%. So we, we've really seen that even as many women left the workforce during the pandemic to care for family, yeah. The flexibility and the affordability and the relevance of online learning seems to have provided a basis for women to continue skilling even during the pandemic when many of them had to leave the workforce. Mm. Our time is almost up, but I want to ask you this last question. If we found ourselves together in another nine years, mm -hmm having a fireside chat on whatever form of um, virtual communication was operating then. What do you think the world will look like? Where will Coursera be? How will these trends and these changes that you've described be taking effect and affecting us? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, I, I could speak a little bit about higher ed, but, but even more broadly, the world's becoming more digital and the world is accelerating faster and faster. So I say rate of change will be faster in nine years than it is today. Amazingly, I, it is because technology enables faster development of new technology, which is just sort of self-perpetuating. So the rate of change will be higher. Dislocations will be higher. I think economies will be creating value in different ways. Employers will be looking for different skills. I believe the pressure that that puts on higher education will continue to increase. I see it's like a matter of physics. There is no question that academic institutions will adapt. They will adapt because if they don't, then there will be other institutions that will take their place. And a major reason why they will be able to adapt is they're not going to have to do it themselves. Institutions will be able to use technology and new models like Coursera for campus where you can rent online courses from other universities and you can even rent professional certificates. When I say rent, you can license them for your students from other industry providers. And so I do believe that higher education will be the hub of adult learning, but they'll be integrating far more resources and methods from other institutions. So I think institutional collaboration, we're already seeing it rise quickly. That's gonna be a much bigger feature. And then the final thing I'll just say is online learning is definitely here to stay. Even students on campus, 71% of students in the UK say, I want to keep learning online, even if I'm having a residential experience. I, I really like the flexibility and the currency of the online learning. So online learning is here to stay. 
But I believe a huge transformation is going to be remote work. Companies like Coursera will allow their employees to work from anywhere. And that means students graduating from a university where there maybe aren't a lot of job opportunities, if they have good bandwidth and if they have good skills, they will be able to avail themselves to economic opportunity, not only in their country, but on a global basis. And I think that's going to really help level the playing field on who has access to opportunity. It's going to be those who are best skilled. And of course, higher education should be at the center of that opportunity. Jeff, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I, I cannot recall half an hour going more quickly. And there are so many more things I would like to ask you. So maybe it won't be nine years, but I hope that we will have the opportunity to, to talk again. Uh, yeah. Every success to Coursera. And thank you so much for joining Thanks, us. Thanks, David. It's been a pleasure. I appreciate it. Thanks. And now we move on to a session entitled Building Institutional Capacity for Excellence in Online Teaching and Learning in Higher Education. And our presenter is Dr. Jerry Handley, Executive Director of Merlo and Skills Commons. Jeff, welcome. Well, thank you so much, David. And I just really want to thank the Association for Arab Universities, the Gulf Education team, and all those involved with planning this Middle East Education Thought Leadership Forum. And, uh, and today, I'm also um, here re representing a team of people. So my one voice is also um, representing O'Donnell Learn, the Online Learning Consortium, and Odigia. And we also have many other uh, partners that really empower uh, building capacity for online, for excellence in online teaching. And as many of the speakers have already been talking about, that it's the COVID pandemic has really created the necessity for higher education to deliver online. And I think rich in talent and also rich in tradition, Arab universities are positioned to really respond to this necessity. When you have the strategic plan for uh, by the Association for Arab Universities that provides uh, a roadmap that started in, you know, before uh, the pandemic, 2019, they began to lay out a roadmap that can really be important when you begin to look at, and I think it's really important to keep in context any innovations that's gonna help um, Arab universities move online is thinking about what plan is, has been developed by these institutions. So the first one is around the critical nature of the technologies that really enable the networking of researchers, educators, partners, knowledge and information. And the CEO of Coursera made that point very importantly about how to leverage all that knowledge and to facilitate the partnerships among the Arab universities. And I think also among the, the regional industries that need to work more closely together. Now, a critical element, I think, that's also in this strategic plan is how do we really transform the way we're doing this learning to enable the learner themselves to have a more effective and successful experience of bringing that expertise into their own personal capabilities? Now, how do we then the next goal is around scale and strengthen the quality assurance. And I think um, Tim earlier on talked about how the, the differences between the competencies being developed and the assessments and the different viewpoints that we have, are we really preparing our students for effective education is becoming really important. Now, when you have the other goal is around strengthening the AARU's governance to really fulfill this strategic plan, 400 institutions is not a simple organization to help move forward. And what's the support, the strategic advice and the, and the governance strategy that, that could be really important. And finally, the sixth goal, enable universities and partners to produce solutions to regional and global strategies, making education contextually relevant for people's lives, for government's lives, for industry lives, very important. 
So I think all these become really important now. One of the challenges often that, that we're facing is this complexity of 400 institutions. When you're having six goals and there's 31 programs laid down in that 70 plus plan, 70 page plan with eight regional uh, organizations and councils and 22 specialty, it becomes overwhelming to try to think about how do you really make this change? So what I'm gonna do today and one of the purposes I have for today is to present you a metaphor to how to think about how you have to coordinate all these efforts and in particular, building the internal capabilities of your institution in order to achieve these outcomes that are becoming so necessary. And the analogy is going to be around how do we think about education, a little bit about like running a restaurant. Now, one of the critical aspects when you have this is that you can have the vision of what you want to do, and often the strategic plan lays that out. But if you haven't built the institutional readiness, the capability and capacities to fulfill the operations of doing the education, planning the education, delivering the education, enabling the formative and summative assessments that become so important, then you're, you're not gonna be successful. So how do you make sure you think about organizing what you're doing in, within your institution, building those internal capabilities become essential? So when we think about running this, your university as a restaurant, right? Ingredients are gonna be such a, an important element to bring in and you're gonna to have to have a variety of meals to serve. And in our strategy, one of the things that we've, looking, that we've looked at is that how do you bring this online instructional uh, content and the research to be stored that are in your libraries, that are online. Coursera, you can think of that's part of the ingredients that you can bring into that. And I'd say rather than just relying on the ingredients in the past that you've had just in your backyard garden, that there's really a wealth of online resources that are available um, for you here. One of them, and I'm the executive director of Merlot, here's a free, open, online, library, we've been around for 24 years of faculty sharing their educational content from simulations, animations, tutorials, full courses, um, and, and all types of collections of materials across all different disciplines that provide you, in a sense, the pantry for you to draw upon. And even our smart search enables searches it's over 75 other open libraries that, that are out there. And as um, Jeff at, uh, CE, uh, at Coursera said, affordability is one of those critical factors. And so when you're thinking about your institution bringing free educational content so they have the ingredients to begin to imagine what are the recipes that they can now do within their institution, this becomes very important. Now, also, it's just not about the academic elements, where do I go to get workforce development resources? And the US Department of Labor invested $1.9 billion in funding 700 community colleges to innovate their workforce development, manufacturing, IT, healthcare, construction, oil, mining, agriculture, all these different elements. And They've asked, they asked me to put together this national library of free, open educational resources for workforce development. So between Merlot and Skills Commons, these are places where you can grab your ingredients, bring it in into your institution in an affordable way. In addition, I'll just say, we also have strategies to enable you to implement apprenticeship programs, work-based learning to support soft skills in a whole variety of ways. So just to help you realize that from the ingredients, well, stored ingredients that you have don't cook themselves. What becomes important is where's your kitchen and who are your head chefs and your faculty are gonna be these critical head chefs to enable that to occur. 
And what's going to help you bring the kitchen together? And this is where, when we look at helping your institution develop its capability, we partner with O'Donnell Learn that has a purposeful learning framework that brings that capability. And now you want to think about, I have the food. Now, what are the recipes, the pedagogical strategies that enable me to help my students learn the skills more effectively? How about the advising strategies? How do I deliver the program? How do I do my assessments? And so O'Donnell's um, purpose for learning strategy is focused on the per on, on people, and that's a critical element of the transformational learning program that the AARU strategic plan puts in place about how do you teach people and not information? How do you use evidence-based practices to ensure that they're learning effectively, both in a formative assessment? What are the strategies for have universal design for learning to achieve equity and inclusion? So all these elements become very important. And think of this, this is the kitchen and the recipe book that you can bring in to support your faculty becoming really the master chefs within those areas. And this is also where sometimes I need different equipment in my kitchen. And so O'Donnell Learn also provides these studios to help you design your materials for the unique needs for your programs. So from the, you know, you bring the ingredients, you now have your kitchen, the professional development of your faculty is essential to give them the tools that they need to create the learning experience that they're connected with because they see your students, they're engaged with their needs. And that's why the role of faculty and supporting them is so essential. And helping them understand what are the critical quality assurance strategies that then become important. Now, you have your ingredients, you got your kitchen. Well, without the dining room, without the place to bring all your customers into place, you really need those platforms. And there are a variety out there. And one of the ones that we've been working with, because it's a competency-based education platform that really enables you to be able to provide information in an integrated way and then assess their learning along the way really becomes important. And I think what Tim talked about early on was how important formative assessment is to achieve those competency outcomes. Now, one of the things about, you know, in your dining room as you're designing it, if you come into a dining room and the, and the restaurant person goes, ah, go, you have to go look for your silverware and your dishes and your plates. They're not organized on your table, you know, in a convenient way at arm's length. That really creates a problem. And so this is where I think you want to think about when you're designing your dining room, and in the AARU, you have 400 tables, 400 institutions, how do you leverage the similarity and the shared needs and the unique needs that are important for every institution? And so this is where when we think about how do you bring the technology platform that allow you to customize your educational program for your unique students within your programs? How do you track that student's progress, engage them in active learning to enable them to really bring learning into themselves, just not be distant, and then finally assess it to ensure that you're meeting those uh, quality standards for, for your education, all right? So ingredients, kitchen, your dining room, and now, your servers, the people who connect all these resources to create that final learning experience that really is attended to the students, the faculty, the staff, the industry and the community are all part of the people who are being served. And think about your servers and what they do and how important they are to welcoming your patrons, making them comfortable, getting what understanding what they need is and, and then looking at the menu and providing those guidance to what will be best for them. Now, when we look at what the Online Learning Consortium, again, another member of our group, that they have annual meetings where we bring all people together to share across the international forum, 
exemplary practices to enable all the complexities of learning to become successful, providing workshops, webinars, mastery series, certificate programs, all these elements that really become important to build your internal capacity to deliver high quality online. And, and I'd say my um, emphasis here is, is going to always be around what we want to do is really design, develop, and deploy your solutions, not ours. And I think one of the things that, that, that I would want to emphasize in, in my perspective, and sometimes it's uh, different from many others, is that building your internal capacity is going to be really important for the long term. Educational transformation, the complexity is something that does require long term planning, and your strategic planning is very important. But building the capabilities of your community and your industry leaders the administrative leadership of your rectors and your provosts, the faculty, all become important. And I'd say having an internal capability rather than outsourcing all these capabilities, because we've seen when crises occur, sometimes the supply chain breaks down. So you really need to make sure you build those internal capabilities. Now, when you're thinking about those strategies, how do you do that? You know, having been working in higher education in an administrative role for 20, 30 years in various ways, beginning with the first step of understanding what do you already have? Where is the talents, the capabilities, the resources, the people, and aggregating those assets becomes really important when you're trying to go on this journey. And those assets are not just within your institution, but also within your industry sectors, your partners within that community, who your students are gonna move into their pipeline of employability. Now, one of the things that often happen when you begin to bring all these resources together is that you find many of these organizations, these units really don't work well together. And building those bridges, to enable that collaboration, and this is a theme that's throughout the strategic plan of AARUs, is collaboration and facilitating and leveraging each other's work becomes very important. And that really takes a strategic support, and that's what I think the AARU can provide that help in facilitating building those bridges. But you also need to do that within your own institution. And I think Jeff at Coursera has said, technology can really in create capabilities by making it convenient and affordable to have access to instructional content and services with technology so important and that's what you really want to think how does technology become a gift for people and not a burden now we can build all these services but if you don't in a sense develop the demand through communication, training, professional development, you'll be building something that no one uses. So the, the role of supporting the way your leaders are looking for, so they're developing their own skills so they can take advantage of the collaborations and the capabilities of technology. And often all this won't happen without your leadership without the implementation of policies and business models, enabling your ecosystems, right? So all these critical elements, you have to think about how your institution is going to build its capabilities through these different strategies. Now, one of the things that has emerging is it sounds, oh, this sounds like it's pretty easy to do, building these bridges, creating capabilities. But one of the things that, that we found, and this is some data in the US, you have sometimes colleges, their academic leaders think they're doing pretty good in preparing students for success in the workforce. But many business leaders think that only about 11% are actually prepared to serve the business needs. So you're having this disjunction between different stakeholders. And that's gonna be a really important process. Even the learners are saying, boy, 
Having digital skills for the workplace is going to be a prerequisite for the success, yet only about 4% feel that they're satisfied in, in the level that they have of their digital skills. So, so these differences really become something important where you have to begin to think about how far you really need to go. And to do that, you have to know where are you beginning? And this is in building these internal capabilities, your institutional capabilities, that assessments of the needs of your learners to your employers, what are their current capabilities and how are you gonna really add value? Spending time thinking about those become very important. And if you wanna go far, you have to know where you're starting from and what you're gonna bring with you. Now, the complexity of higher education is also about going together. How do you bring yourselves together in that coordinated collaborative way? And that involves making sure you share that vision and evaluating how the needs that you are bringing to your institution are really meeting those needs of your communities and the industry. Monitoring your growth and capabilities, looking at the enrollments that you have, looking at the revenue that you have, all these become uh, the evidence of how you are bringing, are the employers satisfied with the skills that your students have? And I'm coming down to the, the end here when we have looking at what are some of these critical factors that you want, looking at the strengths and talents, growing your enrollment and to produce um, your net revenue, building your reputation with evidence becomes so important and using technologies as an extension of human capabilities. And we have a team of people that we have to bring together. And just to you know, we've already working with you in many ways. Uh, we, we've been working, for example, at the um, American University um, in Iraq and Salamani, uh, working with the Texas um, in, uh, International ed um, ed Education Cooperative, our online uh, learning consortium, working with people. And already, we have almost 2,000 Merlot members throughout your countries uh, working together. So, and the approach that we have is kind of a best in class, looking at advisory services. And I think at the end here, to put the ARU's 2030 vision into practice, thinking about, and we have to end since I use restaurants as analogy with a feast, where all, where all have a place at the table and are satisfied. And in order to do this, I think it's gonna be very important that you really think about your leadership guiding your online programs to make be more scalable and through collaboration. And, and this is really about learning from another through a process that can be powered by your vision for a 21st educational institution preparing learners for the 21st century. So David, thank you so much for that opportunity for us sharing um, the strategies that we've learned over the years. And um, we look forward to uh, collaborating. And this is kind of a little bit of the appetizers um, that, that we can help you with. So, and uh, happy to answer questions. Well, let me keep with your restaurant analogy and say, well, that was a very nourishing uh, input to our, our conference. And we, we have one question already on the chat. And if anybody else would like to put their questions there, um, please do so. Uh, the, the question is um, from Hussein Saylor. Uh, based on my experience of teaching undergraduate students, I've seen that students can often get bored. So what are the key factors for making an online course effective, by which I think he means retaining their interest and enthusiasm. Okay. Um, and now, first, I'll say education is about teaching people, not information. All right. And the first step, I think that's so important, is building that relationship between you as the faculty member and the student as the learner, right? they have to begin to develop that trust that you have something of value, that there's something exciting that's coming forward in this process. So the first step I think is 
you as an instructor expressing, I'll say, an understanding that you are a person and you're interested in their well-being and having some empathy about the circumstances, knowing a little bit about what that student is trying to deal with. Mm. Because if they're bored, well, what is attracting their attention? And if they're struggling with, you know, um, with COVID and um, my parents have lost their jobs and all these other aspects, and now I'm trying to, you know, develop my skills so I can be effective in bringing in revenue for my family, right? By knowing a little bit about that, that student, then that helps you choose examples in your teaching that connect with their lives. So, so that's, I'll say, a relationship aspect. Mm -hmm. The next aspect is going to be around engaging the student as an agent in their own teaching by having simulations and animations that technology that can, they, in a sense, play with so they can learn the outcomes of their, um, their actions is becomes very important. So they see what I've learned now makes a difference in what I can do. And that's how you really deal with people kind of being bored is, is an engaging process that connects with them. There's a second question down here on the chat, which I want to develop a little bit. The question says, is age a hurdle to follow certain specific programs, namely technical ones? The way I want to develop the question is, is this. Your analogy of a restaurant assumes that students are coming to the restaurant on one occasion to get a meal that will keep them going for a period of time. In fact, what universities are doing are preparing students for life however that life might change. So I'm just wondering what your thoughts are about how universities play that role, drawing on the vast resources which you have available. Well, one thing is I'll say on the age issue is your restaurant needs to have a pretty diverse menu, right? And there are different nourishing needs for different populations. And so, again, if your institution is teaching people, not information, understanding the learning needs, and sometimes you get those from your industry partners as to what are the skills that for employability, whatever your age, or it could be what are the upskilling that I need to do. Yeah. And so thinking about what are people what are people prepared for is is an important aspect and i think that's the david your the point around you if you don't uh, you can have a restaurant that's all ready to go but if you put it in the wrong location and you don't market it to the right people you're going to go out of business so the institution as part of a community and what are you doing on the leadership side the enabling ecosystem and developing the demand, the outreach, the communication, the professional development, all those become very important. Mm. I think the, the other piece of developing this is if your restaurant is going to be successful, you've got to serve the food that people want. And the food that people want in an education context is both what the students want and what industry wants and what organizations that are emerging in the fourth industrial revolution will want. I, hearing the Egyptian minister this morning uh, talk about some students are not yet ready for what they are now offering is, is quite a challenge. So just quickly, what are your thoughts on how do you decide what menu you're going to offer? Right. And and this is our work with uh, industry and skills commons that actually building bridges between industry and education is essential. And there are strategies, organizational strategies, and we've developed in a sense recipes for how to build partnership pathways between industry and education. And that involves really listening to industry about those skills and then having having higher education figure out 
how do I teach those most effectively? So that needs to be part of your instructional strategy is building those, paving those partnership pathways. So the, the road to success for your students goes out of your university and into successful, sustainable employment. Well, Jerry, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, you, along with the previous speakers in this session, have given us a huge amount to think about. We wish you every success. And uh, to the audience with us, we are now going to take a short break until the, the top of the hour when I really, really hope that you will come back because our speaker is Dr. Jamil Salmi, formerly uh, head of tertiary education at the World Bank. And he's going to give us a very broad look at what higher education looks like in the next 10 years. So thanks again, Jerry. Uh, enjoy a short break and we will reconvene at the top of the hour.